Welcome to our continued discussions for intermediate logic. Here we talk about alternatives to standard first-order logic. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to focus first on alternatives to propositional first order logic, and then second, we'll turn to alternatives to predicate logic. When it comes to alternatives to propositional logic, the primary issues for propositional logic have to do with, or at least the ones we're gonna focus on, have to do with bivalence. Bivalence is the view that there are precisely two truth values and every well-formed sentence has one of those two truth values. It's either true or it's false. It can't be both. There's no intermediate truth values. There's no missing of truth values. There's just true and false. Alternatives to this that we're going to look at include three and many valued logics, supervaluationism and intuitionistic logic. So let's talk about those first. The first thing we need to focus on are the arguments for abandoning bivalence. Here, there are at least three, maybe four different arguments to consider. The first problem, perhaps the most difficult problem, is the problem of vagueness. Vagueness leads to the Sorites paradox. For example, Warren Buffett is rich, the homeless guy on the street isn't rich, but it's hard to specify a precise line between being rich and not being rich. Am I rich? Are you rich? Hard to say. When it's hard to say, it's sometimes attractive to think of the claim in question not having a truth value or having an indeterminate truth value, something other than being true. A second issue is the problem of future contingents. A contingent is a claim that's not necessary. If it's a contingent claim about the future, it's supposed to be something that's not determined by the past or present. So it's left open in some sense. Aristotle is famous for his initial discussion of future contingents. The example that he wanted to focus on was whether there will be a particular sea battle tomorrow or not. The important thing to understand here is that this claim is supposed to be contingent on the decisions of individuals whose behavior is not determined. So whether there's a sea battle or not tomorrow has something to do with what the people in charge of the ships decide to do or don't decide to do. The reason this was a problem is because there's an argument for fatalism that arises from the problem of future contingents. So the argument for fatalism goes like this. Suppose there will be a sea battle tomorrow. If there will be a sea battle tomorrow, it's always been the case that there will be a sea battle tomorrow. If something has always been the case, it's a claim about the past. Things that have always been the case are things that have this past-tinged character to them. But the past is necessary, as Aristotle said. Not even the gods can change the past. So if claims about the past are necessary, then it's always been the case that there will be a sea battle tomorrow is necessary. And hence, it is also necessary that there will be a sea battle tomorrow. Hence, the future is no more open than the past is. This leads some people, and some people claim Aristotle held this view, to think that claims about the future really aren't either true or false. Future contingents come to be true or false when the events in question occur. Prior to that, they are neither true nor false. A third argument against bivalence is the problem of failed presuppositions. Think of complex questions. Have you stopped beating your dog yet? <laughs> 
Now consider the claim you have stopped beating your dog. Is that claim true or false? If it's true, then you used to beat your dog. If it's false, then you're still beating your dog. And maybe both of those presuppose that you in the past have been beating your dog and suppose that's false. Then what do we say about the claim, you have stopped beating your dog? Is it true? That has a bad implication. Is it false? That has a bad implication. So perhaps the right thing to say is the claim is neither true nor false because it has a failed presupposition. You could say the same thing about whether the present king of France is bald. There is no present king of France. So if you say the present king of France is bald, that sounds mistaken. If you say the present king of France isn't bald, that too sounds mistaken. So neither claim is true. It sounds like. So one approach is this is another reason to abandon my valence. Finally, there's the problem of incomplete fictional objects. So think about Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus. If you're not familiar with this parable, the rich man has all sorts of nice things. Lazarus is begging. Lazarus eats the scraps of food that fall from the rich man's table. The rich man dies and goes to whatever part of the afterlife that's not a very nice part of the afterlife one goes to. And there's a story about the rich man wanting some sort of prophet or person to go and talk to his family. And that's what the parable is about. But ask yourself this, does the rich man have more than one ring on his fingers? It's central to the character of a fictional object that they're not, com they're not characterized in complete detail. I don't know how you'd be able to do that even if you tried, but actual objects are complete in a certain way. So if you go get Warren Buffett, does he have more than one ring on his fingers? I don't know, but there's a precise definite answer. Is there such a precise definite answer when it comes to fictional objects? Is there a fact of the matter about whether the rich man has more than one finger? Sorry, he does have more than one finger, more than one ring on his multiple fingers. Maybe you're attracted to the idea that there's just no fact of the matter. It's indeterminate. It is neither true nor false that the rich man has more than one ring on his fingers. Those are the four primary arguments against standard first-order logic with its assumption of bivalence. It's also worth noting, before we look at Lukashevitz's system, it's worth noting that first-order logic derives from the work of Frege in the 1870s. Frege is the father, father of modern logic. Frege, however, was not a fan of bivalence. It wasn't until you got to Bertrand Russell in England in the early 1900s that you found bivalence creeping into the system. And Bertrand Russell was a notorious, unflagging defender of bivalence. Modern logic is bivalent primarily because of Bertrand Russell, not because of Frege. In any case, suppose you're moved by any of these four arguments to deny bivalence. One way to do it is to introduce a new symbol for indeterminacy, call it I. So now we have three truth values. We have T, F, and I. So for example, if we introduce this and construct a truth table for negation, we get the standard lines that we're familiar with from first order logic that involves bivalence where you just switch the truth values. If you know a truth value of t for phi, the truth value for tilde t will be false, and vice versa when you switch from false to true for the entire formula. Negations simply switch the two primary truth values. 
if the truth value of indeterminacy is added, we just remain neutral. If phi is indeterminate, so is not phi. So that's the starting point for Lukashevitz's system. Similarly, look at the truth table that we're going to use for the wedge. The wedge, remember, stands for disjunction, typically expressed in, in English using the word or. Now, you know from the standard truth table that the truth conditions for the wedge are very lax. It's very hard to get a wedge formula to come out false. If our true truth values are just true and false, there's really only one way for a wedge formula to be false. And that's picked up on this truth table in the fifth line. Both the first disjunct and the last disjunct have to be false in order for the whole thing to be false. What should we expect when we introduce a third truth value, an indeterminacy truth value. Well, again, the first time this appears on this truth table is in line three. If one of the two disjuncts is true, again, we have very loose truth conditions for the wedge, so one is enough. That means if the second disjunct or if the other disjunct, it doesn't matter if it's first or second, is either false or indeterminate, the whole thing comes out true. It's very easy for a wedge formula to be true. The only time we get indeterminacies is when we lack information that one of the two is true. Now, if they're both false, that's enough to get the wedge formula false. But if one of them is false and the other one is indeterminate, then we just don't know. So we assign an indeterminacy truth value to the complete wedge formula when either one is false or when they're both indeterminate. What about conjunction? Conjunction makes it very hard for a formula to be true, so we should expect that something like that will carry through once we have a third truth value. And that's correct. We get true whenever they're both true. We get false when either one is false. And we get indeterminacy when one of them is true and the other is indeterminate. Or when both are indeterminate. So notice that's what happens in line eight. They're both indeterminate. In line six, one of them's true, the other indeterminate. And in line three, one of them is true and the other indeterminate. That's all it takes to get indeterminacy into the picture. So falsity of either conjunct is sufficient for getting the entire thing to come out false. Both being true is sufficient for being true and turns out also to be necessary for them to both be true. For arrow formulas, here's where it gets interesting. We know from first order logic that assumes bivalence that there was only one way for a conditional to come out false. That's represented here with the second line of the truth table. You get false for the whole thing when you get a true antecedent and a false consequent. That carries over to our current discussions. It turns out that arrow formulas are pretty easy to come out true. They come out true, for example, every time you have a true consequent. That's the same as in standard first order logic. They also come out true whenever you have a false antecedent. That's lines four, five, and six. 
in notice. They come out true. So all of those features of standard first order logic are preserved here. The question is what happens when we get indeterminacy? Well notice if you've got a true antecedent and an indeterminate consequent, you now get an indeterminacy. If you have an indeterminate antecedent and a false consequent, you also get an indeterminacy. Those are not very surprising because in both cases you're risking a falsehood. If you have a true antecedent, a false consequent would undermine the conditional. If you have a false consequent, a true antecedent would undermine the conditional. So if you have an indeterminacy in those two cases, the indeterminacy is crucial and it generates an indeterminacy for the arrow itself. The last question is, what do you do when both antecedent and consequent are indeterminate? Lukashevitz's idea was, well, then the conditional is true. We'll come back to that line of the truth table in a moment. In any case, that's the truth tables for four of the connectives of standard first order logic. And I'm going to ignore the truth table for the double arrow since that's just a conjunction of conditionals. An alternative to Lukashevitz's approach is that of clean. Clean tables are generated in precisely the same way as Lukashevitz's tables except for the conditional itself. And notice, what does Clean think of Lukashevitz's system? If you look at those two tables, I'll give you a moment to inspect them. Just look at them. Where do they differ at all? I'm sure you saw it. You had to get all the way to the end before you saw it. But Clean thought Lukashevitz made a mistake. Clean thought that if antecedent and consequent were both indeterminate, the entire conditional was indeterminate as well. Lukashevitz thought if they're both indeterminate, then it's true. I think the reason he thought that, it's not quite clear that this is the right story, but here's one thought. Every time antecedent and consequent agree on this truth table, every other time except for the last line, if antecedent and consequent have the same truth value, the conditional comes out true. So notice that happens at line one. And it happens at line five. When antecedent and consequent agree earlier than line eight, the conditional comes out true. So get down to the last line, antecedent, consequent, agree, we ought to get the same result. It's a pleasing symmetry, you might think. Clean, on the other hand, thought, well, look, if they're both indeterminate, why are you assigning any truth value at all of the TF variety? Why wouldn't that be the right time to say, we just don't know. We lack enough information, so there's no fact of the matter about whether the arrow formula is true or false, hence we assign an indeterminacy operator. Cider has an argument in the textbook against three-valued logics. Here's the way one version of the argument go, goes. Suppose that phi is neither true nor false. If phi is neither true nor false, then phi is not true, and not phi is not true. But then a contradiction is true. Now here's a point at which I think we need to be much more careful in our argument, and much more careful about our use of symbols. I want to explain why in terms of the language of use and mention. Let me write two sentences here 
on the screen for you. First sentence, that crate has a rat in it. Now, when I say that, you don't know which crate I'm talking about, but you're interested, right? You're looking for a crate, a thing in the world. You know what a crate looks like. And to tell if it's true or false, you got to see if there's a certain animal in it. Good. Here's another sentence. Well, actually, let me do it this way. Let me leave the sentence the same and just put some marks on it. Single quotes around crate and rat. Now notice I am mentioning the words crate and rat. I am not using them. To use them is to talk about something in the world. To mention them is to say something about this collection of letters. The collection of letters C-R-A-T-E which form a word crate. The sentence now says the word crate has the word rat in it. That's not about crates and rats. That's about the words crate and rat. And it turns out to be true. That is, at bottom, the use mention distinction. To confuse use and mention is to make a very serious logical error. It seems like an utterly trivial one, but one can fall into it and make a mess of your logic very easily. So take a look at argument one. It has phi and not phi in it. What is phi and what is not phi? Well, phi here is a variable for a sentence in the language that we're talking about. So you might think something like use mention is going on here as well. So you might think the right way to formulate this argument is to talk about the symbols, because frankly, what is that? That's a symbol in our logic. What's it doing attached to a variable for a formula? How are we supposed to understand this? It's, it's a strange creature. It is composed of something that's part of our first order language and something that's not part of our first order language. A variable standing for formulas in the first order language is not itself a part of the first order language. So maybe what we should do is talk about these collections of symbols in the way we talked about rats and crates. So maybe the right way to formulate the consequent of the premise is this. Suppose that phi is neither true nor false. So pick a formula that's neither true or false. What happens then? Well, then the value of the formula in question is not true, and neither is that formula preceded by a tilde. So put them both in quotes so that we're talking about the formulas themselves, since it's the formulas themselves that get assigned a truth value in first order logic. If we do it that way, then the argument requires us to get a contradiction from that claim instead. And to do so, we need a further claim. The further claim we need is the disquotation schema. So here's a disquotation schema. Notice what's going to happen is I start with something involving quotes on one side of the if and only if, and I end up with that same thing or something related to it without the quotes. So maybe what we should do with this argument is say, in quotes, phi is not true, 
That's the fundamental thing that we assign a truth value to in standard first order logic. We take a formula itself and assign a truth value to it. So we need some quotes around the formula to talk about the truth value that it has. And then suppose we say phi in quotes is not true if and only if, and then we drop the quotes, not phi. If you're bothered by the fact, as I would be, that this is a symbol in our logic, we can drop that symbol. We can, instead of say, not phi, tilde phi, we can just precede phi with a negation. That's a disquotation schema. Now, if we apply this schema twice, we do get the contradiction that argument one above claimed we could get. With two applications of the schema, we get not phi and not not phi, and that is a contradiction. If you're attracted to three-value logics, where do you think you might want to resist this argument? It looks to me like you should start wondering about whether the disquotation schema is true. Should a three-valued logician accept the disquotation schema, or does the disquotation schema itself presuppose the standard bivalence picture of first-order logic, classical first-order logic? Perhaps it does, or perhaps if you're a defender of classical first order logic, you'll think the argument one above doesn't really need the disquotation schema, but it needs something or other to keep from mixing together the first order language and the meta language so that we don't have one symbol pretending to be parts of both. So maybe we have to be more careful than argument one in some way or other. We don't need the disquotation schema, but we need something. That's a possibility. In any case, argument one is too quick, but maybe something like that argument is sufficient for undermining three-valued logics or causing problems for them. I think it's not as easy as argument, argument one makes it out to be, but perhaps there's something there. All right, let's talk about comparing Clean and Lukashevitz's systems. Here's an interesting fact about it. So when you do meta theory about standard first order logic, you look for differences between the two. And you ask yourself, are these differences significant? So look at Lukashevitz's system. P arrow P is valid, but P or not P isn't valid. That's an interesting fact. So valid means this. From no premises at all, it's a semantic consequence of nothing whatsoever that P arrow P is true. However, it is not a semantic consequence that P or not P is true. This last one, by the way, is standardly referred to as excluded middle. We'll come back to that term because it's going to be important when we talk about intuitionistic logic. So what do you make of this fact? Is this a good consequence or a bad consequence? For example, might it help with the sea battle argument? The sea battle argument was the argument for fatalism. Either there will be a sea battle tomorrow or there won't. Take your pick. Whichever, whichever one you pick, it's always been the case that the one you picked has been true, so it's necessary. But if excluded middle isn't, isn't a theorem, 
the argument can't get off the ground to start with, because it started with take your pick, either P or not P, where P is about the sea battle tomorrow. On the other hand, Lukashevitz is committed to the claim that if there will be a sea battle tomorrow, then there will be a sea battle tomorrow. Perhaps you can't get the sea battle argument to run on that premise, however. Perhaps you really need excluded middle. And since Lukashevitz doesn't have excluded middle, the argument doesn't get off the ground. Okay, that may be a, a mark in favor of Lukashevitz. Maybe it's an argument against if you're a fan of excluded middle. But in any case, for K, clean system, here's an interesting fact. There are no valid formulas. That means where we take the double turnstile symbol and leave nothing in front of it, there's absolutely no formula. Nothing can be put in after the double turnstile and it come out correct. Nothing is a semantic consequence of the empty set. For example, consider this. There are semantic consequence relations in K. For example, it's a semantic consequence of the conjunction P and Q that Q, an utterly unsurprising result. But it's not a semantic consequence that P and Q implies P or that P and Q implies Q. Verify that with the truth table. As you will see, the reason the conditional fails is because when you have all indeterminacies for the atomic formulas, this formula is going to turn out to be indeterminate as well. I expect you find that latter idea confusing. Because in standard first order logic, when you have take any set of premises x, suppose y follows from x, or suppose y is a semantic consequence of x, well then the arrow formula can be proven from nothing at all. Just think how conditional proof worked. If you want to prove this, using conditional proof, you assume x, derive y, and then finish your proof by appealing to conditional proof. Very simple. But notice that's just what you would do to complete a proof of this sequence. You would assume whatever the information was in x and derive y. The only difference is you wouldn't have to do another step. You wouldn't have to use conditional proof to go to x arrow y. You'd already be done. That's called the deduction theorem. The deduction theorem says if you can prove psi from phi, then phi arrow psi is provable from no premises at all. And the semantic analog here simply replaces the provability symbol. Remember, the provability symbol is a single turnstile with a double turnstile, the semantic notion. So the semantic analog is if phi is a semantic consequence of, I'm sorry, if psi is a semantic consequence of phi, then this is a theorem, phi arrow psi. That connection is lost, which means on clean system, the deduction 
theorem fails. That looks weird. It looks like it's going to force you to say something different than conditional proof when it comes to your proof theory. Notice as well that if a system is sound and complete, as standard first order logic is, you can't have DT for that system without also having its semantic analog. We can conclude then that DT fails for Clean's system. Those are two interesting facts about Lukashevich's system and Clean's system. But you might think, look, if you're going to have three truth values, we should generalize. Why stop at three? Perhaps you can think in this way. We've already used one to stand for T and zero to stand for F. We might as well then use one half to stand for I. If we think that way, there's lots of fractions that fall between zero and one. So why not introduce truth values for every fraction that you can have there? It will turn out that you can do such a logic and it still be truth functional. You just have to expand the number of truth values available. So this invites us to think in terms of degrees of truth for a system instead of truth and falsity itself. How do we do this? Well, here's one way to do it. One way is to define the wedge and the caret in terms of maximum and minimum values for the formulas that flank the connective. So if you've got P or Q, remember this is a very permissive connective. So if you have degrees 0.7 and 0.3 for a wedge, that looks like a three. It's actually supposed to be a seven then the whole thing ought to get the higher value of the two. On the other hand, if you have the same, whoops, if you have the same atomic formulas with a caret, the caret is restrictive rather than permissive, so the caret should get the lower of the two. And then, once you have those two stipulations in place, Negation is pretty easy to characterize. So for example, if you negate the first one, you'll just take one minus that value. So the value under the negation would be 0.3. If you take the negation of the conjunction of the two, it's one minus this value. So it would be 0.7. You may have noticed this already, but you don't really need five different connectives. All you really need, once you have negation, is one of the others. So if you've got negation and wedge, you can define all of the other connectives in terms of those two. If you have negation and ampersand, you can define all of the others in terms of those two. And similarly for the conditional and biconditional. So, once I've told you how the maximum and minimum values work, if you define all of the other connectives in terms of those two, you'd have a complete system. That's how it worked in standard first order logic when we had two truth values. Here, it's a little bit more complicated because you have a choice to make when it comes to conditionals themselves. How do you want to assign truth values to P arrow Q? One approach is just to do what we did in standard first order logic. Just define a conditional in terms of the wedge and the tilde, which would result in a value for P arrow Q with degrees of truth U and V for P and Q, namely as the maximum of one minus U or V. Let me write some things on this screen to help you see how that goes. Remember, P arrow Q is interderivable with 
either the antecedent is false or the consequent is true. So suppose we just do that. We've now defined the arrow in terms of negation and wedge. We already know how to assign truth values to the stuff over here. Whatever the value of P is, suppose it's point, I think, what did I have, point 0.7 and point 0.3, if you negate a 0.7, you end up with a 0.3. So a wedge takes the maximum of the first disjunct or the second, since they're the same, the wedge would get 0.3. If we define the arrow in terms of wedge and tilde, we should get 0.3 over here. And that's just the maximum of 1 minus this value, which was 7, and this value. And 1 minus 0.7 is 0.3. So that's how it would work if you define the conditional in terms of the wedge and the arrow. It's not necessary, however, to go that direction. An alternative pro approach suggested by Lukashevitz's two systems. He had L sub M and L sub infinity. The difference between the two won't be important for us, but the first one has finitely many truth values, the latter infinitely many. In both systems, Lukashevitz thought we should define P arrow Q or U arrow V, where U and V are variables for numbers, as the minimum of 1 and 1 minus U plus V. What would motivate this approach, the minimum of 1 or 1 minus U plus V? So we're looking at the minimum of 1 and 1 minus u plus v. So let's think about the second number first. How was, Lukash how was Lukashevitz thinking about this? Well, this number, the lowest it can be is 0, and the highest this could be is 1. In that case, you take 1 and subtract 0, so you'd have 1 and then you'd add 1 to it. So in that case, you'd get 2. So the minimum of 1 and 2 is 1. The point of this first number, then, is to make sure that no conditional gets a truth value higher than 1. Every time u is smaller than v, this number will be larger than 1. In which case, Lukashevitz is going to want to assign a value of 1 to the formula in question, to the conditional. Intuitively, then, what Lukashevitz is thinking is this comes out as maximally true when there's more truth over here than there is here. What happens when there's less truth here than here? In other words, when u, the value for u, exceeds the value for v. Take a case. Just use 0 0.7 and 0 0.3. Then we take 1, we subtract 0.7 from it, and then add back the value of v. The difference between the two is 0.4, so we'd get 1 minus 0.7, which is 0.3, and then we'd add back 0.3, so we'd get 0.6. So the difference between the two is just what we're going to get as the sum.
in question. And now the whole thing, the minimum of 1 and 0 0.6 is 0 0.6. So what Lukashevitz is thinking is when there's more truth here than here, we want to measure the difference between those two and drop our evaluation of the truth value in question to that number. When there's less truth to the antecedent than the consequent, then we're going to assign the maximum amount of truth to it, which is just one. So intuitively, the way he's thinking is we're going to measure what we do with conditionals in terms of which of the two has a greater degree of truth. When the antecedent has a greater degree of truth than the consequent, then we take 1 minus the sum, and that will be the value for the conditional. When the antecedent has less truth, than the consequent, we're just going to go with 1. Intuitively, then, what he's trying to do is measure what happens when you got a stronger truth value for the antecedent than you did for the consequent. If you had a stronger truth value for the consequent than for the antecedent in classical first-order logic, that just guaranteed that the whole thing was true, because a true consequent was all you needed. So as long as v is a higher number than u, you get the maximum value of 1 for the whole thing. It's only when there's more truth in the antecedent than the consequent that something else happens. So that's an alternative approach. To the one that defines the conditional in terms of the wedge and the tilde. Notice that if you do the latter definition, you lose the wedge arrow rule, the one that I appeal to for the first approach, because it assigns a truth value of 1 to every conditional where the consequent has at least as large a truth value as the antecedent. When the value for the antecedent is higher than that of the consequent, the truth value of the conditional is less than 1, with a limit of 0 in the case where the antecedent's value is 1 and the consequent's value is itself 0. Notice how natural it is to talk about this approach in terms of degrees of truth rather than truth. It's a sign of Frege's influence here that it's so natural to think in logic to think of logic in terms of truth conditional semantics. Although we can trace this, by the way, to George Boole in the earlier part of the 19th century. For example, when we get to probability theory, or if you've studied probability theory, we often refer to a Boolean algebra on propositions, which is just what truth tables provide. And you can also trace it to Charles Sanders Peirce's 1885 paper predating Frege's explicit formulation in 1891. Part of that influence is how weird it is to hear talk about degrees of truth. Since the 19th century origin of this way of thinking about logic was unremittingly bivalent, only the muddle-headed Hegelians and other idealists talk about degrees of truth, you might say. We should be careful here, though. Why should we be careful? Because the notion of truth itself was suspect in the early part of the 20th century, especially to people involved in the Vienna Circle. They were interested in a logic that would be adequate for doing science, and they weren't happy with anything that couldn't be given explicit definition free from paradox. And people in the Vienna Circle were particularly concerned about the notion of truth because of the liar paradox. The liar paradox involves the sentence, at least the direct liar, involves the sentence, 
this sentence is false. You can't assign either true or false to that sentence without also have, having to assign the opposite. There's also another paradox called the heterological paradox, also known as Grelling's paradox, first published in 1908. So define an adjective as either autological or heterological, depending on whether it describes itself. So long is heterological and so is monosyllabic. But is heterological, that word, it is an adjective, is it, is, is it itself heterological? So here's the paradox. Let Q is heterological mean that Q is not Q, where Q does not characterize itself. So heterological either characterizes itself or it doesn't, so assume it is heterological. Then it doesn't characterize itself, so it's autological. Assume then that it's autological. Then it does characterize itself, so it's heterological. That's a contradiction. These paradoxes about truth led people to worry the truth itself was not well defined. And so maybe the fact that degrees of truth are being talked about in some logics is not so bad as it might seem. Here's an, a further argument, though, from Timothy Williamson. Williamson teaches at Oxford University. He's one of the best known philosophers in the world right now. Here's an argument that we can glean from his writings. Assume then that we can't blithely assume bivalence and express derision for talk of degrees of truth. Williamson, however, thinks there's another argument that we can use to show that bivalence is something that we ought to be at least more inclined toward than alternatives. Note that many valued logics are still truth functional they only generalize on the number of inputs into the function. But then consider the claim, the relationship between John is awake and John is asleep. The two, once you introduce degrees of truth into the story, they can have the same degree of truth. And so whatever truth function we use on these two, sentences, these two will be evaluated the same. We're supposing now that John is awake has a degree of truth that's the same as John is asleep. Then our truth functional account of the arrow formula is going to give us the same result for these sentences. If John is awake, then John is awake. If John is awake, then John is asleep. Williamson's point here is that you have to like the first sentence. Nobody should get away with rejecting the first claim that if John is awake, then John is awake. No matter what the circumstances are, you should endorse that claim. But you shouldn't have the same attitude toward the second one. That gives us an argument both against clean and Lukashev's systems. The clean system doesn't like either of those two claims. Lukashev's system likes both of them when they have the same degree of truth. So Williamson is convinced that's a bad consequence. Let's go back to bivalence. So enough about three and many valued logics. Is there a way to escape Williamson's worry without endorsing bivalence? The answer is there might be. Supervaluation is just such an approach. Supervaluation appeals to the notion of precisification. Notice that on the earlier systems, P and not P is indeterminate when both of the conjuncts are indeterminate on the above systems, clean and Lukashevitz. But consider what happens if we precisify the indeterminacy here in terms of the two truth values that characterize bivalence. If P is true, its negation has to be false, and so the conjunction would be false. 
if we precisify P so that it comes out false, its negation must be true. And in that case, the conjunction is false as well. So when we push the indeterminacy to determinate truth values in either direction, the formula always comes out false. So if we precisify Williamson's examples, one of the conditionals is always true, while the other one isn't. The first one, if John is awake, John is awake, always comes out true. If John is awake, then John is asleep, doesn't always come out true. In fact, it always comes out false. So you might think we didn't need to abandon multiple truth values beyond just true and false. We didn't have to endorse bivalence to get away from Williamson's argument. We just need supervaluationism in place of the many valued logics that we were looking at earlier. So on this approach, supervaluationism is the view that a sentence is true just in case it's true on all precisifications and false if it's false on all precisifications. Notice that this means supervaluationism kicks in only for complex formulas involving connectives. If you have an atomic formula that's indeterminate, it's going to just stay indeterminate. It's not true, no matter what. But some of the complex formulas that involve indeterminacies all the way through at, this, at the atomic level might turn out to be true, even though everything underlying them is indeterminate. So this allows excluded middle to be depended even for formulas involving indeterminacies, and it allows non-contradiction to turn out to be true as well, even if the particle in question is itself indeterminate. Note, however, that that makes supervaluationism to be not truth functional. That's what lets it yield a response to Williamson's argument. Is that a problem? Maybe. In any case, even though it has three truth values, here's an interesting relationship between it and classical logic. It preserves classical logic in the following sense. Every formula that's semantically valid in classical logic is also semantically valid in supervaluationism. So remember what it means to be semantically valid is just that it follows from no premises at all. And if you have something that's semantically valid in classical logic, It's also semantically valid in supervaluationist value, logic. That's maybe a good counter to the claim that supervaluationism isn't truth functional. The supervaluationist can say, yeah, you're right, my logic isn't truth functional, but it does everything that you wanted if you were a classical logician. It preserves all of the semantically valid claims. If we turn this way to supervaluationism as a compromise between the three-valued and many-valued logics and classical logic, it's tempting to characterize the logic that we're now thinking about in terms of what we get by claiming that some sentences have determinate truth values and some don't. It's tempting to do that. But Williamson has another argument that this is going to cause further problems. So suppose some sentences have determinate truth values and others don't. We can characterize that just by supplementing our logic with a determinacy operator. We'll use delta to be our determinacy operator. So delta phi is false whenever phi is either false or indeterminate. Suppose we decide to do that. But then phi semantically entails delta phi, given our definition of delta phi. So assume phi, then on any precisification, phi is true, so delta phi is true. 
but the related conditionals are not all true. It's false that if middling Mary is rich, then she is definitely rich. So we're back to we're back to the deduction theorem and its semantic analog, and giving up these is a fairly steep price to pay. And that's what Sider notes in his discussion of supervaluationism. If you allow supervaluationism to be supplemented by this determinacy operator, then you end up saying things that run counter to the deduction theorem and its semantic analog. You're going to get semantic entailment relations between formulas where the related conditionals turn out not to be sustained. But that's just what the deduction theorem and its semantic analog told you hold in standard first order logic. And it's a hard pill to swallow to be giving up the deduction theorem. That is Sider's point. So maybe supervaluationism is a bad idea. Do we have any other ways of rejecting bivalence? The answer is there's at least one more. This one is intuitionistic logic. And intuitionistic logic has as its natural heritage the constructivist tradition in philosophy of mathematics. So the constructivist tradition supposes that you're not a realist about mathematics. So Plato thought there was, in fact, a platonic heaven that had all the mathematical objects in them, which sounds a little bit strained if you're a hardcore empiricist. So suppose you deny realism about mathematics, and so you want to say, in some sense or other, the truths of mathematics are constructed by the activity of mathematicians rather than discovered by them. Then the idea that there being mathematical facts already in place has to go until it's shown that something mathematical holds. Until we can show it, we aren't in a position even to hold that either it does or it doesn't hold. So you're not a realist, and so you're just hands-offish with respect to mathematical proposals until and unless we get in a position to demonstrate that they hold or doesn't hold here. Now that sounds very close to what three-valued logicians have been saying. It's very easy to drift toward the three-valued language of indeterminacy here. Refusal on excluded middle means that neither the claim nor its negation is true, and hence that both are indeterminate. But that's not the case if you're an intuitionist. An intuitionist doesn't deny excluded middle. An intuitionist merely refuses to endorse excluded middle. How can they do that? Well, it's a tendentious claim, but one way to think about it is to try to tie truth to provability more closely. In fact, suppose we just identify them. Mathematical truths are truths, are claims that are provable. So, if P, then P is provable. If not P, then not P is provable. So if excluded middle held, then one of the two would be provable. But since we're not entitled to that conclusion, we aren't entitled to excluded middle. Just think about the notion of provability. There's lots of claims where neither the claim nor its negation is provable. So, excluded middle doesn't hold if truth is the same thing as provability. In parentheses, I note here the paradox of knowability. I'm not going to go into that here in this lecture. We can talk about that during office hours if you're interested. Okay, so distancing yourself from excluded middle is one thing, but the double negation of excluded middle is provable in intuitionistic logic. So they don't deny it. They don't say P or not P is false. 
they just refuse to endorse what's in the parentheses here. They withhold on the claim. And the reason they do is because that is provably a theorem. It is both provable and semantically valid in intuitionistic logic. I hope that too comes across as something of a head scratcher to you. Refusal on excluded middle goes hand in hand with refusal on one direction of double negation. Think of it this way, if not not P is connected with what's provable, what it commits us to is that it isn't provable that it isn't provable that P. But of course, that's not to say that P is provable. So if you carry the identification of truth and provability all the way through, you can see why they don't like double negation. But the head scratcher part is, I bet you're a bit uncomfortable with the idea that double negation should be given up. So we have three alternatives, maybe you count them as four, to standard first-order logic driven by the four arguments with which we began. So there are first three-valued logics, and then we generalize from them to many-valued logics. When we see certain problems with that, we turn to supervaluationism. And when we see problems with supervaluationism, maybe we turn to intuitionistic logic. There are no trouble-free alternatives that we've seen to classical first-order logic, but this gives you a sense of what logicians work on when they're trying to solve problems for a logic that they see, problems that they think need to be taken care of. In the next lecture, we will turn to alternatives to classical first-order logic when it comes to predicate logic.